Good morning. <laughs> um, uh, it's 9:59 slash 10, so I'm going to go ahead and start. I'd like to first um, apologize for the hoarseness. I guess my um, my voice didn't want to cooperate today, but it sounds a little bit better today than it did yesterday. Um, and so, um, my name is Vivian Muhammad, as most of you may know. I am a member of the Indiana Black Farmers Co-op, and I've been tasked with the um, title of how the Indiana Black Farmers Co-op is helping to alleviate the food deserts in Indy, <clears throat> and specifically Indy. I am myself uh, an urban gardener, graduate of Purdue's Urban Ag Certificate Program, and in 2013, we purchased some um, quarter acre lots very near where we um, live and began um, gardening and growing food for our neighborhood. And I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail as we go along. Now, as I was thinking about how to present this, it occurred to me that I really need to start with the issue, the problem, the so-called food desert. because. How can I talk to you about how we're working to alleviate it until we really drill down on what it is we're talking about alleviating in the first place? And so I'm going to start off talking about food deserts and <clears throat> what that actually means. So then there's this cookie cutter definition that is a USDA definition. Food deserts are defined as part of the country vap uh, of the country vapid of fresh fruit vegetables and other helpful whole foods usually found in impoverished areas this is largely due to the lack of grocery stores farmers markets and healthy food varieties and i call that a cookie cutter definition because it really doesn't deal with <laughs> what a food desert is and the name itself is a problem and the USDA came up with this map, which kind of shows in some kind of weird way where the problem is. And even this map doesn't really tell us much, right? It's just there are some areas where it looks like the problem's really bad and some areas where it's not so bad. But one thing we know that it's not just a question of the fact that a food desert quote, end quote, is an area that doesn't have a lot of fresh produce. A food desert also, as this talks about, is not only devoid of the fresh fruits and vegetables, but they are heavy on local quickie marts that provide a wealth of processed, sugar, and fat-laden foods that are known contributors to our nation's obesity epidemic. The food desert problem has in fact become such an issue that the USDA has this map. But it's not just obesity, right? We're talking, we're talking about diabetes, we're talking about heart disease, we're talking about cancer. Um, in the same areas where you find a concentration of food deserts, you tend to also find a concentration of fast food restaurants, et cetera, that only lend to the problem. So a low amount of fresh produce but a high amount of all the things that we don't need to eat. But I wasn't really satisfied with this since, because it's still not enough. I have come from a philosophy that, and um, in our meetings, we used to talk about this a lot in our co-op meetings, that this food desert issue is, is, has at its undertones a very racist um, reality attached to it. And that's never being talked about. So as I was preparing for this, um, I went online and started Googling and came up with this <laughs> lovely lady. <laughs> <laughs> and I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> because as I started reading from what Karen Washington was saying, it was like, hallelujah, yes, you were honing in on um, the real issue. She's like, food desert? No. How about food apartheid? And <clears throat> I can't say it better than she did, so I'm going to read it. 
She's like, deserts make us think of an empty, desolate place, but there's no, such, so much life and vibrancy and potential. And then she goes on to say, what I would rather say instead of food desert is food apartheid, because food apartheid looks at the whole system along with race, geography, faith, economics. You say food apartheid and you get to the root cause of some of the problems around the food desert. It brings in hunger and poverty. It brings in the more important question. Boom. What are some of the social inequalities that you see and what are you doing to erase some of the injustices? In other words, this isn't just an issue on the surface about, oh, these areas of the community don't have grocery stores, but they have a whole lot of McDonald's and a whole lot of, there's a whole construct, a whole system um, that we have to start looking at if we're really talking about alleviating the food desert issue. And that's why the language that Ms. Washington used excited me so much because I felt like it really finally spoke to some of the underlying problems, some of the root problems that have given rise to what we call food deserts. She goes on. <laughs> I call this the elephant in the room, pun intended, because our gardens are called the elephant gardens, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, I've always considered this subject to be like the elephant in the room, that when we're talking about food deserts, we are always talking about let's put more m markets, let's put more of this, and we're not talking about some of the other forces arrayed against us. Um, Karen, again. She said, in my neighborhood, there is a fast food restaurant on every block from Wendy's to Kentucky Fried Chickens to Popeye's to Little Caesars Pizzas. Now drug stores are popping up on every corner too. So you have the fast food restaurants that of course cause the diet related diseases and you have the pharmaceutical companies there to fix it. They go hand in hand. The fact is, if you do prevention, someone is going to lose money. If you give people access to really good food, and a living wage job, someone is going to lose money. And as long as people are poor, and as long as people are sick, there are jobs to be made. Follow the money. Wow. So that says a little bit more than just food desert, right? Um, when we're talking food deserts, you know, it doesn't really drill down on what's really happening. Because we're not just talking about the fact that there aren't any grocery stores between here locally, Arlington and Sherman from 46th to 30th, not a one in that entire area. We're not just talking about that. We're not just talking about the fact that coincidentally there are in fact a McDonald's and a Popeye's and gas station chicken and dollar food, uh, dollar stores on every corner. Instead, we're talking about the fact that we are literally up against a construct the fast food industry, the pharmaceutical industry that actually doesn't stand to gain anything <laughs> from us making better <laughs> healthy food choices, right? So there's a whole, while we're all in this room trying to push for a healthy, 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 we have to recognize that there's an entire system that has its fundamental existence on the opposite of that, which is to eat the fried and the fast food and the heavy laden foods with salt and sugar and, and all of the things that actually help to produce disease in the body. And then there's a pharmaceutical industry there waiting with the diabetes drugs and the high blood pressure pills and the heart disease uh, pills and pills and pills and pills and pills. And that construct is supported by bad choices, right? <laughs> it's supported by uh, creating a desire in the mass populace to choose to eat Wendy's and fast food restaurant all the time instead of in hot fries and Cheetos and whatnot, instead of the tomatoes that I grow or that you grow and the carrots and, and, and the like of the fresh fruits and produce that we know foster health in the body. So the point is, this is not by happenstance. This is not an accident. Um, the lack of supermarkets in low-income inner-city minority communities 
is not a demographic accident or a consequence of natural settlement patterns. And by the way, this comes from a um, quote from another article I found called um, Unshared Bounty, which I found to be um, quite interesting read. It's a pretty long read. It's a research paper that was conducted, I want to say, by the University of New York and the ACLU and some other partners. But it looked at and asked questions that hadn't been getting asked. And that is, is there a system in place that actually helps food deserts to come into be um, versus just us saying this is by happenstance, this is just settlement patterns, this is just how it goes, and more. Because rather, food deserts are a manifestation of structural inequities that have been solidified over time. The structural influence that have resulted in the disparate access to healthy food for minorities are innumerable. Housing policies, financial policies, and government regulations have all interacted over time to contribute to the disparity in healthy food options within cities. <clears throat> and so the structural causes then that were just delineated, residential segregation, commercial flight in general, specifically uh, supermarket scarcity in urban environments and communities, and this last one, the blaming the victim. Now this one I want to hone in on a little bit more because this particular one is used quite often by those who think that this whole food desert thing is a myth or that they, they argue that just putting a grocery store or just having healthy food in a community is not going to change anything because that's what they want to eat. They want to eat the chicken and they like the hot Cheetos and they like the Twinkies and the Little Debbie and all of those. If you put a grocery store in those neighborhoods, they're not going to do well. If you put a fresh time over in quote unquote the hood or quote in quote the hood, it's not going to be successful. It's going to go out of business if it even um, survives the first month. That being said, this, this blame the victim argument has really been elaborated upon and it's not talked about a lot. And this last particular paragraph, ignoring past influences, constraining the choices of minorities, redirects attention from social constraints imposed by institutions on minorities to minorities' personal choices. Choices made with constrained circumstances are interpreted as freely chosen personal tastes. Let me just really drill down on that. I got an option of chicken or I got an option of um, a roast beef sandwich with fries. Though, you know, so we can say I, ha I have a free choice, right? But I have a free choice within constraints. I have a free choice within boxes. So yeah, I'm free. It's kind of like our, our um, political system. <laughs> we got a choice. <laughs> It's Democrat or Republican, but what if I don't like either one of them? So we are free to choose, but within constraints and within confines. And it also fails to, it says the forces that act to make the choice of eating he healthier foods more difficult for minorities are ignored. And instead, minority tastes are characterized as inferior and used to reinforce negative stereotypes of race. And black folk love chicken. They like chicken. They like fried chicken. What? You know, so it's not, that's what it is. You know, I went to my um, cathedral, um, <laughs> um, it wasn't a reunion, but it was um, during Black History Month last year. And, you know, one of the girls that um, I don't remember liking when I was in high school, but after this comment, I <laughs> that solidified in my mind. She says, you know, we were talking, and she says, well, go on, there's some chicken there, you know, and I was like, <laughs> I'm a vegetarian, <laughs> and I am, but it was like, it took me a minute to really, like, did she really just do that? <laughs> and she did it with the kind of smirk and, and undertone of, of, of hypocrisy that really, really um, 
got me as I thought about it later and I was like, wow, we're still living there. Um, not everywhere, but in some pockets of people's minds, they still think that. Um, and these negative stereotypes of race, this, this is used as a justification for why um, markets and good grocery stores aren't in our neighborhoods because <laughs> y'all not gonna eat that stuff. Y'all like this, this, and this. And it ignores the fact that y'all like this, this, and this because that's what was given to us. It's kind of like I always tell people about gangster rap. It's like, did we really just you know, start saying, yes, please, give us the rap that calls women bees and you know, that talks about you? Did, was there really a demand for that? Or was that demand created when we were forced fed this messaging over the radio and then we developed a palette for it? And that's actually what happened. Same here. We have a history of um, slavery. Um, sharecropping didn't make healthy eating easy. Salt, grease were what we had. And Southern blacks bought their culinary taste north. And fried foods such as fried chicken uh, was also easy to transport. So there's a lot of reasoning that goes in, and this is just some of it, um, as to why, the whys and wherefores that we make some of the food choices that we make. The point is, when you ignore the fact that there's an entire system that is constantly putting a programming out there saying, eat this, eat this, eat this, when you inundate a community with this, with all of this, and then say to it, well, you know, the reason we don't have, you don't have a grocery store is because <laughs> we give you what you want. We're giving you what you want. A grocery store wouldn't be sustainable. So it ignores really what's happened and what is happening, right? And it makes the job of those of us who have taken it upon ourselves to really address the food apartheid issue it makes our job much harder because we're not really dealing with root issues, right? We have to go to the root. And we can't just set up a market in our neighborhoods, you're right, and just automatically have people flood it like we would if we were over on Benford's market because we have to untrain and retrain an entire population on how to make healthy food choices. So our markets have food demos, and we'll go into that later when I talk about what we are doing um, in the co-op. We have to do extra stuff. We have to have a lot of bells and whistles because we understand that we are literally fighting against an entire system and that we are also fighting against de pallets that have in fact developed a, so that if you put, as um, <laughs> we talked about the other day, if you put hot Cheetos, and a banana and an apple down on a table, you're gonna have, you know, all the children go, yeah, give me the hot Cheetos. But that's a training. That's, a, that's something that's a conditioning that has happened. And our palates have been basically corrupted. And it starts young. This argument is used in this particular article. It's called Five Years and $500 Million Later, USDA Admits That Food Deserts Don't Matter. This is an article that's using that very argument that, you know, you can, I think there's a quote in there that says you can bring the, um, ho um, you can bring the, the person to the Whole Foods and the kale, but you can't make them eat it. You know, um, and so they're, they're even using USDA report in the Amber Waves, which is the newsletter of the USDA, to highlight that households and neighborhood resources, education, taste preferences, may be important determinants of food choice than store proximity. So they're arguing against the whole idea that if you put a store in a the neighborhood, they will, they will, we will eat healthier. They're saying that the studies show just the opposite. The store can be there, the healthy food can be in near proximity, and they're still gonna eat the unhealthy food. And they're ignoring all of those other factors that we just delineated. So, and I think the article prior um, wrote this one, the myth of the food desert was also um, arguing that same point. It was arguing that our palates are part of the reason and that this whole idea of food desert, 
food apartheid is just this made up thing that if you put a store in the neighborhood, it's not going to make the people any healthier. And on its face, frankly, there's some truth to it. But what it's not doing is drilling down on the whys and wherefores that that is the case. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, food pantries and the use of food pantries is on the rise. And where they're supposed to be something used as an emergency, they're now being used on a weekly basis just to sustain. And that brings me once again to <coughs> Ms. Washington, who started the Black Urban Growers. And this, um, where she said, our subsidized food system, as the activist and community organizer Karen Washington points out in the interview that follows, skews the cost and value of food. That was another uh, thing when I read it, I kind of started jumping up and down with the Holy Ghost because it was like, yes. We tend to always, in a way to help, always think, let's give food away. Let's, let's, let's put food pantries in the neighborhood and give the people the food. For a farmer like me that works very hard to grow the food, that makes my job harder. Because then when I'm on my corner trying to sell my food, you know, they're like, I don't want to pay $2 for a carrot, as Karen says. She says, my carrots are $2. They are $2 because I am a for-profit farmer. And unlike carrot for 99 cents is sold in cellophane at the store, supermarket down the street, or the bunch of carrots that you got for free from the food pantry, this $2 carrot is feeding me, my family, and it means something. And that's another issue that we have to address is in our effort to fix the problem, we can inadvertently be creating another problem. There's a book called Toxic Charity that I recommend you um, peruse if you give a, uh, given a chance. And it's basically talking about how charity, although well-intentioned, sometimes can actually cripple the initiative of the people that you're helping, okay? <clears throat> so let's go local before we get into who we are because this problem is local. Agriculture in Indiana, multi-billion dollar industry. Farmers produce more hogs, eggs, watermelons, tomatoes, eggs, turkey, corn, and soybeans than any other state in the country. I didn't know that, especially on the watermelons. Yet in Indianapolis, the city Smack dab in the middle of more than 14 million acres of farmland, one in six residents reported being food insecure. Yet other data shows that as many as one out of every five residents live in a food desert. And that number might be on the rise after uh, several grocery stores have closed. Elderly, low income, without reliable transportation are particularly affected by this lack of access. And then it goes on to say in that same article, half of Indianapolis's east side is in a food desert and the rest of the city also contains, contains a large swath of food deserts. We got some major problems here locally. Um, there are statistics out there that say we're the worst in, out of all 50. Um, Ms. Shelley Settles with our sustainability program at the mayor's office will tell you, wait, 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 that's based on this study. And she's right, it's based on the criteria for determining what a food desert is and what that means varies and consequently our ranking varies depending on what criteria you use to determine if we're in a food desert. But the bottom line is we got a problem and we have a pretty big problem. An estimated 200,000 Indy residents live in food deserts. And so this map, which was um, put uh, together by um, the mayor's office, and you can go on Savvy, S-A-V-I, I think it's Savvy.org, and you can get all this data. Um, it's all there to be looked at. Um, but it talks about the areas, all the ones in the purple, are the areas where we have um, major, major problems. That's a lot of purple. <laughs> That's a lot of purple. and. Um, this, the research of the USDA and their maps and their criteria is a little different than our own. 
savvy using their methodology <coughs> comes up with even a worse picture for us. So using this local methodology, which factors what they call LA and LI, low access and low income, low access, using this methodology, we found that 71% of Marion County census tracts have low food access. However, when we look at the block group level, which is smaller than the census tract, it's 61% that have low food access. The USDA's data found that 40% of all tracts had low food, des food access. By reducing the travel distance to actual distance and using updated grocery store data, we find that the food deserts are about twice as common as what the USDA shows. So the criteria that they've used is a little bit more accurate, basically, because uh, they talked about um, USDA, just, USDA just using where the distance, like if you were a bird <laughs> and you're flying, and since we're not birds, <laughs> and since we have to walk and or drive, they use different criteria and it made the distances a little longer, right? Because once you turn this corner, we know the short, shortest distance between two points is a straight line, but we're not going in a straight line here. We're going like this to the grocery store or wherever. And once they changed that and used actual distance, then actual driving distance, it increased the um, number of people that live in food deserts. So just looking at the data differently actually produces different results. But I would say that either data you choose to rely on still shows that we've got a major problem in Indianapolis and in Indiana <coughs> at large. This particular map was provided by, um, to me by uh, Michelle Shippey um, with REACH. Um, she works with the um, Green Bucks. And this shows where the concentration of, um, of minorities is and where um, farmers markets are located. And I found this one particularly interesting because of the work that we've been doing. And um, if you can see, I mean, the, look at the large concentrations of minorities, and where do you see the markets? All around those areas, none in those areas. And um, we're going to talk about that in a little detail a little later, but that's a major problem. So not only do we not have grocery stores, because I can count the number of grocery stores that are in that area as well, but we don't have markets either. Farmers markets aren't setting up in those areas. Um, and there's a reason, again, they're, they're looking at profitability. They're looking at, it, you know, are people going to come and blah, blah, blah. And plus, they just tend to set up where they set up for a number of different reasons. But these areas, the areas in which I live and the areas in which I grow food, where some of our members grow their food, are not being addressed. So even though we have all these people growing food, nobody thought to set up a farmer's market in our area. Nobody cared to do that. And we were already in a desperate situation before, before um, but now with no markets being set up, it just makes it worse. So this food scarcity with the lack of supermarkets, and I, I really, just like this picture <laughs> because it kind of in a artistic way kind of shows you the difference and it's so stark between really the options of people that live in so-called food deserts in a construct of food apartheid and because we're going to talk about that later on a panel I'm not going to go all into that but um, the food scarcity issue has grown even worse in Indianapolis since the closing of the grocery stores. So first we had double eight. Um, and when that, those stores closed, I remember um, going to Kepra Institute to a big community meeting that they had to discuss this issue. Now mind you, I hated double eight myself. I just absolutely hated the store. It, it had inferior produce horrible meat, the smell in the stores was horrible, but guess what? It served a purpose and people needed it because they could also buy toilet paper there. They also could buy a lot of goods there and they needed groceries and it was close. These all closed in one fell swoop in one day. 
the residents of the communities didn't even have a 24-hour notice. It literally was same day closing. The, the employees found out the same day. So it went from being, you know, four or five double eights in our areas to none overnight. And this really is what revved up this conversation about food deserts and it's really what made organizations like Kepra and, and me and others, I was already farming, I was already selling my food there, but it just made it like, whoa, we gotta, we gotta grow more food, we gotta do more. Um, this, is, this is really getting bad. And it's still bad, it's worse now. Um, because after the double eights closed, then the marsh closed. They closed 18 different stores, but we could scarcely um, afford to lose the marshes that we lost where we lost them. On the um, east side, I think it was um, at 38th and Post, am I right? Um, when the marshes closed, that set another ripple effect in place because an already bad problem became that much worse. A lot of the store closings weren't in food desert areas, but the ones that were, the ones that closed that did affect us, like the one at uh, 38th Street, that hit hard. It hit hard because we were already in a desperate situation. And then, just last um, year, last fall, Kroger at, 30, at 46th and Arlington closed. And this was really bad. And this is when um, Shelly Suttles approached us. I think we were at a food con event. Um, which was an event at Heron High School, and Shelly Suttles, the lady I mentioned, that's we call her the food czar um, in the Office of Sustainability. She's like, we got to do something. And so you see some pictures of members of the co-op. This is the, the empty Kroger, literally overnight. I think there was a two-week notice for this, um, and this hit hard. You're talking about a community that was already just really desolate. Now, you know, there were two senior homes right across the street from this Kroger. They barely had transportation. They were, there were literally Kroger carts lined up at the senior home that they would use to walk across the street to get groceries and supplies and come back. Now nothing. And someone from the mayor's office had the audacity to say, well, they could catch the bus to Meyer. Now, we're talking 46 in Arlington for those that are local all the way to Meyer, what is that, 54th and Keystone? <laughs> it's like they can, just, they can just take the bus. It's like, sure, these elderly people or these seniors can, and how many bags can they carry on that bus? You know, what's that ice cream and that milk gonna look like when they get home in 90 degree weather and, and a host of other logistical problems that made that comment absolutely asinine and insensitive. Um, not to mention impractical. But the Kroger closing really kind of was a crescendo moment. And um, it has snowballed. And what it has done is made this food apartheid um, really, really, really more evident. Um, if you're local or if you're from Indianapolis, like I said, if now I can go as far east as almost Post Road and as far west as past Sherman, headed to Keystone, almost to Keystone, and I can go as far north as 46th Street and as far south as really past 30th, and there's not one grocery store in that entire area, not one. You have to get to Franklin before you get a Walmart, which is a little bit, so you've gotta go farther east than Arlington all the way to Franklin Road, and then at 38th and Franklin, there's a, a community Walmart, a smaller Walmart, not a major Walmart, and then there's a Save-A-Lot. If you go west, um, past several streets past uh, Sherman, but there is a Save-A-Lot on 38th, and, and it's subpar. And um, none of them sell organic produce, um, so that's another issue. Of the stores that we do have, there's a Safeway at 25th, so five blocks south of 30th. Um, and then, of course, the Save a Lot. The, but as far as organic produce, nada. It's not offered there. Because you know we won't buy it. 
<clears throat> so, the Indiana Black Farmers Co-op, finally, who we are. Now that I've kind of given you an idea of the problem, both on a national and local level, what have we done to address it? What have we been doing? Well, we've been really busy, busy, busy. So each of us that belong to this co-op have established our own individual urban farms. Um, on a few of those, we have uh, selling on site. We do, and um, Lawrence Community Gardens does as well. We have conducted healthy food demos, mainly at our markets, um, but we are also in senior homes conducting these healthy food demos. Uh, we established the co-op. Um, and the whole point of it was to help inform and strengthen the black farmers so that we could start tackling and drilling down on some of these issues ourselves, since no one else was doing it. Um, we established farmers markets. Now on this particular issue of farmers markets, this was a really big deal. I once had a girl tell us, well, what have you guys really done? I mean, you don't even know how many people have come to your market. What have you done? It's not a big deal. It's like, well, we did something that nobody else thought to do, <laughs> that nobody else was bothering to do. Um, we had zero farmers markets in those areas that are predominantly minority um, inhabited areas. And we started realizing that there was a problem with what we were doing because we were growing the food. We'd sell some of it locally, I mean, on site. And then the rest of it, we were going to market at Heron and Benford and you know all these places that aren't food deserts, but where there were existing markets and we could have a, a, a place to sell our, our produce. And we realized that there was something very wrong with that. And so we decided to start our own farmer's markets and we established our first one that was our own at St. Andrews, which is at 38th and Forest Manor, kind of in between um, Sherman and Emerson on 38th Street, which is a major thoroughfare in Indiana and in the heart of one of the worst food deserts that we have. Um, we also established another one at Cafe, 38th and Post. And then we started um, um, over the winter months um, at Flanner House. But Zion Hope, uh, which is at 46 in Arlington, was the market that was born out of that closing of that particular Kroger that I mentioned earlier at 46 in Arlington. And the mayor came out and um, everybody um, made a big deal of it because they knew that that closing really was like a death knell to um, that, that issue and made it just all the more difficult for people. It just took a problem and exacerbated it and made it that much worse. So the establishment of the markets is a big deal um, because there are no farmers markets in those areas. Now when I say we have to have bells and whistles, yes, we have to have a DJ at our market, but most markets have music anyway. That's not that big of a deal. But we have food demos because we understand that there has to be some educational component involved. You don't know what eggplant tastes like? You don't want to buy this eggplant? No, I've even had, that's white people's food. You know, I, oh, I've had that said. Or what do you do with that? You know, so, okay, well, have you ever had eggplant parmesan? Have you ever had, and so we really have to really educate to get them to try and to learn that eating other types of foods that they may not be familiar with or is comfortable eating, you know, they, they'll take okra and they'll fry it, but have you ever had sauteed on? No, I don't like it, it's slimy. No, not if you do it like this. So the food demo then becomes a critical component to helping undo that uh, issue that we talked about earlier of the palate and what we have developed a taste for and helping us to kind of reverse that by getting them to try other stuff. Um, the youth programs are also a way to do that. Last year on Lawrence Community Garden, um, which is the garden of Sharana Moore. Sharana, can you let everybody know who you are, who doesn't already? Um, her garden had a youth program, 45 members strong. We all worked to um, help that program. And um, this year, um, we're pushing for every one of our co-op members to kind of have their own youth program because that's key. So um, the Elephant Gardens has established one in conjunction with 4-H and the Junior Master Gardener program. 
So um, it's, it's coming about, and that's very important because we get the youth, we get them, it's, studies have shown that if they grow the food, they're more likely to eat it. So getting them involved in a stair has already kind of given you all a picture of how effective having youth programs is and getting them to make healthier food choices. Esther, has that had an effect on the parents? Yes, it does. Oh, yeah. Very, Very much. much. It's like it's a parent. Yeah. I mean, it's a no-brainer. How many times have I bought something, not because I want it, but, but because my child has said, you know, mommy, you don't want that, you know, and you're like, okay, sure. Well, it's the same thing um, with food. We have found that, and there are plenty of studies to validate this, that if you start exposing the youth um, to better eating habits by virtue of having them work on the farm mm -hmm. and get familiar with the food and the produce and the whole process, that you are creating a, a condition whereby they are more likely now to make better food choices. I really like the Junior Master Gardener program that Purdue offers um, for two reasons. Number one, as a farmer, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> I don't have to think of a whole program. It's already there. And from my point of view, that's really good because when you're working, you know, your time it has to be split in so many ways. But the second reason is because the program itself is really cool in that it has a food demo component and it helps them to learn this idea of healthy food choices. It really drills down on that. And then, of course, it has the go work in the garden, how to grow food part of it. But it's, I think it's a very holistic um, approach and I really like it. Um, and so I'm excited to kind of incorporate that into our youth program this year. The establishment of partnerships in the area. So we have tons now, everything from the Urban League, Flanner House, um, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, Purdue Extension, of course, Oak Street Health, Community Health Network. These are just a small listing of some of the partnerships that we have developed um, to help alleviate this problem. We're talking about a multi faceted problem. It has to then have a multi-pronged solution, right? It can't, it's not just one thing. It isn't just bringing a grocery store in. It isn't just starting markets. It isn't just food demos. It's, it's all of it. It's, it's all of it. And the establishment of relationships um, with uh, new grocery stores, this is exciting. So Eastern Star has created or established a grocery store called The Rock. Um, off of 30th in between like Emerson and Arlington on 30th Street. Really great because um, we need it. <laughs> and they have, um, we've met with them and they have um, said that they would buy our produce to have in the grocery store. So now we've got this synergistic relationship going with them. And then A&I, which is a um, black man named Robert Hurst, has uh, started a grocery store at 38th and Post called a and Market, um, also very good, and has um, said that he would also buy our produce to have at, at this market. So again, these synergistic relationships that help everybody. And um, then there's tons of others. There's uh, Planner House is building a bodega this is on the northwest side of town. Well, not northwest. Really. Is it northwest? Is that near northwest? I know. Okay, thank you. Um, and they have a, 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 how big is the garden over there? So they have 1.8 acres of actual food growing space, and now they're establishing a bodega. Um, this is really big because that area, as a, right down the street from Flanner House, is a closed double A. Um, building so it's really important so these all these little steps are very important and then we're also um, helping the existing CSAs I mentioned Kepper earlier and how they were kind of at the <laughs> forefront when this problem um, surfaced uh, or really it was always there but when it really took center stage with the closing of the double eights because those closings were so instant I mean, it was just like no warning. It really kind of threw everybody into a tizzy. Um, and Kepra Institute, they're at 35th and um, Boulevard. 
um, they, they started really wanting to play an active role in addressing the problem and they established a CSA, a Community Supported Agriculture Program called TCFI and um, they um, basically people in the community buy shares of produce and they distribute them on a monthly basis so they actually buy from local growers to fill those shares at a wholesale rate of course and TAB is another um, CSA that exists right now. And then we're working to establish our own CSA specifically with senior homes. What we noticed in regards to this senior home issue that really bothered us, we had a market right after the closing, you know, in conjunction with the city, right at Zion Hope because it's across the street from where the Kroger's used to be. And afterwards, all of the farmers donated the rest of the produce to the two senior homes that I mentioned earlier. And when we went in to deliver it, um, it kind of really had a really lasting impact on me because their food pantry, or what they called their pantry, was, it was pitiful. Um, they had maybe eight cans of corn and a couple of boxes of macaroni and cheese, and that was it for two senior homes because there's one that's from 55 and older and the other 65 and older. So that was it. And I was like, is this all you got? And she was like, this is it. And I was like, what? And she said some of the seniors, when they run low, they'll sneak into her and like, do you have anything? You know, this is crazy. Come on now, we can do better than this. I mean, this is ridiculous. And it's one of the reasons why we started to really kind of hone in on the senior homes we started to go around at the beginning of the year to about eight different senior homes so far to try to see if there was an interest among them in receiving produce on a monthly basis. Um, so far we've got a pretty good response, um, but we're going to circle back and I think that that is going to be a, a worthwhile endeavor because they need it. Um, and they are really in dire straits, especially with the closings and their in transportation being an issue for so many. So uh, that CSA effort is in play. But who is this co-op? And I've been mentioning some of the, the folks that are involved, and that's not, uh, okay. It's, it's not really <laughs> how it all began. Who, who are we? I'll just go to the next slide. Oh, okay, you just want to take forever to look. <laughs> <laughs> We're the founders. Um, there was one additional founder. She's not um, with the co-op anymore. Um, Lawrence Community Gardens, um, Sharana Moore. Sharana, can you say, everybody say hi to Sharana? Sharana, <coughs> her story is pretty interesting. And um, she basically saw a need that was born out of her trips to the pantry with her brother. And um, she took the initiative, and I'll explain more about that later. And then Elephant Gardens, that's myself and my mom. Mom, raise your hand. <coughs> and um, Mother Loves. Um, and that's Taisha. We're the founders, but we're not. Is Taisha here? Yeah, there she is, Mother Love, down there. <laughs> so we just started meeting at the library. Um, initially, it was to say, what can we do to grow more food? <laughs> and how can we help each other as urban growers to do that? And how can we coordinate our efforts so that we have a heavier presence and market? Um, and that's how it began. And it really just took off. Sharana, like I was saying, her story is pretty powerful in that it really began with um, her just seeing a need in the community and taking the initiative to do something about it. She went to Monarch Beverage and said, hey, you guys got all this land back here. You know, how about you lease it to me so I can start this community garden? And essentially, um, they said, okay. <laughs> and she just steamrolled ahead. And um, her story is kind of, I couldn't fit it all on there, but um, it's a powerful story in and of itself, but she went at it. She just didn't stop, and next thing you know, she had a truck uh, um, a, um, to um, go around with the truck to sell produce and to donate produce. They have a you pick section of their garden. 
uh, farm, I should say. She's sitting on about seven acres. Um, and all those acres aren't developed yet, but the goal is to have those acres developed by the end of this uh, season. Um, and so the food that is uh, produced by her efforts, a lot of it goes to, am I correct, a lot of it goes to pantry? I don't know the, how much? 50% 50. 50 to pantries and then the 50% sold. That plus her youth program, which is a five week long program, five days a week, is pretty potent because the youth do so much of the work and they learn so much. They don't just learn about how to grow the food, they learn how to sell it. They learn their financial skills, financial planning, that kind of thing. Um, they get a $50 per week stipend um, with Sharana's program, which is called Next Generation. If you have um, any youth that you might know of that might be interested, I think she's still taking applications, is that correct? Yes. She's still uh, accepting applications for this program. Um, um, just a really dynamic story, and you, I can really go on and on, but she saw a problem and she did something about it. She didn't wait, she just did something about it. And since that time, she's gotten a lot of partners um, in the community to help her. She still needs more help. Um, uh, she needs um, people to help her get a, um, a street, like a paved area so that, you know, the cars aren't sinking as they come. They need, they need a lot and um, they need help and they need finances and resources as we all do to make this stuff keep going. I always like to feature mom because frankly, without her, Elfin Gardens would not be. Um, she's like the wind <laughs> beneath my wings, for real, for real. Um, and without her efforts, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. We call ours the Elephant Gardens because of the nature of elephants and how we felt that symbol fit with our mission. Elephants are herbivores, um, um, so they have a very green diet. So even though they have a large footprint, it's a green footprint. And elephants are fiercely loyal to their youth and to their community. And we felt like that symbol fit well with what we wanted to do. So this is everything from pictures of our greenhouse, um, which is at our home, to pictures of the field. Um, and um, mom in the middle, because really she's She's the one who makes the whole thing work. Uh, we're at 30, 30, 348 Sherman, which is really the heart of Fude, right down the street from another double eight that closed. Um, I think it was at uh, 30th and Sherman. And so three blocks away. And we were already up and running and doing our thing when it closed, but it just made it, like I said before, a dire situation that much more dire. Um, and we have pretty much funded this whole thing out of pocket. Um, we need help. <laughs> um, we'd like to have a greenhouse built on our property um, as well as Sharana as well. Um, we need, always need volunteers, people to help. Um, we're starting the youth program and we're wanna, we want to actually build, we sell on site every week but we'd like to actually build a farm stand right there so that, you know, to get, we're trying to change the culture um, and the mindset. We are quite visible because we're on Sherman, but this is a quarter acre lot. There's another acre, I mean quarter acre, around the corner um, that we also have developed. Um, on that one, we've got about uh, 24 raised beds. Um, and then we have an entire area that's just in ground that we've uh, cleared so far. There's still more to develop on both of these properties, but uh, that's who we are. And Mother Loves and Taisha, we call her the Baroness uh, lovingly because she's went and bought up the whole <laughs> northeast side. She's got like eight lots. Um, and. Um, she's worked heavily with the youth and this is, she's done everything from some straw bill um, growing to train and teach youth and other methods of growing. And um, uh, she, she is really trying to help uh, and I think the Flanner House is going to help her this year to 
try to get some of those lots further developed so that we can really start having lots dotting all over the place that are having have food on all of them that's the vision um, <clears throat> for all of us and we have um, Lakaya who works with Kepra now Kepra has a program called Go growing good and um, growing good in the hood and Kaya was one of their students last year and then this year she's actually running that program these are all co-op members by the way um, and she started hers, uh, she called it Vivacious uh, Garden. She was kind of giving me a little shout out there because I kind of pushed her and said, you need to do this because we need more people growing food, bottom line. We got to have more food. We have so many needs right now. And right now, distribution opportunities are opening up all over the place for us. And we're like, OK, that's great, but we got to have the food. <laughs> Cannot have a farmer's market if we don't have the food. So we are in the process of trying to fully develop every one of the farmers um, that we know and, and ones that we don't, um, fully develop their land to capacity so that they can be growing and be as productive as possible so that we can have more food to be able to address this effort. Um, Legacy of the Taste are our co-op members that are in southern Indiana. They sit on one of the last remaining um, black settlements in the state of Indiana called Lyle Station. They're in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., or the history of this. And um, they grow uh, produce on about uh, four or five acres in southern Indiana. Their father owns even more. But those are some of our partners that um, we have been working with that have brought their produce to some of those markets that I mentioned earlier. Kaya also sells her own um, cleaning product, which I'm addicted to. <laughs> it's an all natural cleaning product that she sells. And then we have um, three sisters. Now three sisters is Cherie. Cherie, can you stand up? I was trying to find pictures of Cherie <laughs> um, and we couldn't find any of her without being around everybody else. But Cherie um, works with Sharana on um, Lawrence Community's Garden, but she um, works a whole acre of her own, which she called Three Sisters because she grows the corn and the beans and the squash. And that's her little granddaughter right there working that land this past summer. And then Prosperity Healing Gardens is uh, um, another one of our co-op members named Selena. Now she's becoming, I guess she's caught Taisha's bug. She's now bought up three different lots very near mine. Um, she got some of the ones that I contemplated getting, so I'm glad because somebody's got them. Selena is buying up lots in, an air, in our area. Can't be happier because we need these lots developed. We have got to grow food. Um, and we, our vision is to just every place where there was an empty lot to now be a place where there's food. Um, and or something of beauty like wildflowers, you know. Um, we have bees on our property. Sharana has bees as well. Um, so we're also trying to um, save our entire environment. And um, Prosperity Healings, she comes up with her own, she formulates her own teas and um, herbal remedies. And so a lot of her garden space will be devoted to growing herbs, medicinal flowers. And this is just a collage of kind of some of the things that we've done. <laughs> uh, these are all pictures of us at some of the markets that we conducted this past year. Um, we were at Oak Street here. Oak Street, um, that partnership developed thanks to uh, Taisha's sister, Khadija. And she put us in touch with uh, the co-op in touch with a lady named Joni Collins. And Oak Street is, works with uh, senior homes. And so they um, have us going into various senior homes, conducting food demos. And then once a month, there's a market on site at the Oak Street facility. Um, and Urban League, again, is one of our partners. They had some markets this past summer, and now they're willing to support our St. Andrews market. So they're going to partner with us on covering the cost and for that market, which is really great. Um, 
and they're also going to help us to promote the markets. And um, so this is Sharana's truck right here, the farm stand, and just some of the various pictures of us at market. Um, that was the Food Con event and Benford Market. Uh, and the rock, uh, I, don't, I don't know why talk is there. It's supposed to be rock. But <laughs> that's an advertisement for um, the grocery store that I mentioned. That's at 30th Street. So essentially, what we're doing is moving forward um, with this uh, plan and this model, which is kind of growing. Um, we are thankful that um, God has given us this vision to, to come together in a cooperative manner to be able to try to deal with this problem because, frankly, it's too much for any one person um, it's going to take a collective effort. We're very grateful for all of our community partners because without them we wouldn't have been able to do all that we have done. And we hope to, by God's grace, to do much more. Um, thank you. So are there any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. We can probably turn on the lights now. We can probably turn on the Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, right. Well, it's like you, you could give them the produce, and, and I don't know, I don't know quite how to eat it unless I get to the shelf, but they, the grandma is not going to cook it, but everybody Absolutely. has lost that knowledge. That's how are you guys addressing that problem? Yes, that's mm -hmm. so true. Um, my grandma, I mean, most of our grandparents probably had a backyard garden, something. You know, for my grandmother, great grandmother, it was tomatoes and green beans, you know. Now there's a disconnect, um, and <laughs> we really knew there was a disconnect when a little girl came over to our garden and she saw some yellow squash growing and she thought it was a banana. And I'm like, okay, we got work to do. <laughs> um, yes, there is a disconnect, not only because we disconnected from the earth itself. I mean, come on, let's admit we're in this techie environment. We're all doing this all the time, you know. I was doing that last night. I'm like, what am I doing? Put the phone down. Put it down. Stop scrolling. We've got to go back to the earth. And I'm really kind of excited to be in the company of, of all of you because I think that there's, as I, I always use this terminology because I really believe this paradigm shift is happening. I believe that we are finally going and returning to the earth. Um, and I think that that's what's going to have to happen. So the youth programs, in answer to your question, are one of the ways that we're combating that issue of ignorance and lack of knowledge about what to do with the food. Um, the Junior Master Gardener program, as I mentioned, it has cooking demos in it, and I really love that aspect of it because, you know, it, you're showing them how to harvest it and then make some kind of healthy fare out of it. The cooking demos um, that we do are another key component, and frankly, I really don't think that um, we can not do those. Um, if we really are going to change and alter the mindset of a, a whole generation or two uh, of, of people um, and get them back in the kitchen. You know, that's this thing about the kitchen, you know, we want to be independent women, we don't want to be in the kitchen. We're food scientists, that's how I phrase it. You know, kind of give a little spin on it, you know. <laughs> We're food scientists. It's not just about, you know, um, cooking or slaving over the stove. Don't look at it like that. So reorienting the mindset is really what has to happen, right? So the cooking demos are, are part and parcel to that, working with the youth in general, teaching them how to do it. There are some programs, like there's this program called SEED in um, Tuskegee, Alabama, and I was... Uh, blessed to be able to see his program and they got to the point where the children were growing it, taking it to market, but every Friday the school got involved and they had, um, they were cooking for them, their parents. So they had a big dinner every Friday for their parents. How cool is that? And so it was a nice little way to get the parents involved and expose them to a different way to eat. So that's how we're combating it. Uh, is there anybody else who's doing something different on that note that might want to chime in? No? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, just kind of going off of that question, I work in a low-income part of the city. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, and it, 
great getting youth involved when you can, but sometimes these kids are going home to a family that's worrying about keeping the lights on. So going to a farmer's market and paying a little bit more for vegetables versus going to KFC and getting a box for $4 of just food, that's gonna be the priority. So when you're talking about training the palate, what are some things that you guys do to help adults make that transition and that palate transition? Well, we're still developing um, methods by which to address that um, because a lot of it is economic. The other part of that is if you put a Whole Foods or a fresh thyme in our neighborhood, could we even afford to go there? Um, unfortunately, the Pogues Run that was um, went out of business not too long ago, it was like a food co-op grocery store and um, a lot of the complaints were that the residents in the general area couldn't afford it. Um, they couldn't afford to shop there. Um, so what do you do about that? I think the first thing you do is that you train them on, I was talking to some children off at Flanner House the other day and man, at first I was like, man, this is a hard crowd right here. <laughs> you know, how am I gonna you know, talk to these young black men about food deserts they don't see? You know, how do I get their attention? And I asked them this question, and it's a question that we have to think about. We have to, number one, get into some financial planning and some, some basic, you know, basic things that have nothing to do with food that just has to do with how to m manage your money, especially when you're living paycheck to paycheck. And I think the shutdown of the government exposed that there's a whole lot of people living paycheck to paycheck or a couple of paychecks to paycheck. But I think a lot of the vast majority of the population is two, three paychecks away from being in dire straits. And a lot of us, I was a single mom, and I made that choice all the time of, you know, bill or, you know, how do I manage this? Um, but we have to teach them the economic advantage of cooking at home. And there is advantage. Um, I, if I teach them, I talk to them about how I make this huge pot of, pot of bean soup, right? And we literally dip out of that pot for the whole week. That pot lasts us the whole week. Now we change it up with a little, you know, bean soup and cream of wheat muffins, bean soup and broccoli, bean soup and salad, but it's bean soup, you know. Um, and people say, well, I don't want to eat the same thing all the time. Well, you know, once you start understanding, A, the economic benefit of planning your meals, it doesn't have to be bean soup, but it, the, if you do food planning, you, you, you will see that you actually save money and you eat healthier and you feel better. Um, it's just about management of money and management of time. These are skills that have to be taught. Um, that's why I said this is a multifaceted problem. It has multifaceted solutions. Um, and then you have to teach them this one last thing and that was what I was telling the boys at Flanner House. It's like, if you had a Mercedes and it said put only this type of gas in it, would you do it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're going oh yeah, to make sure that that Mercedes has the proper fuel. We have to think of our bodies, this vehicle that we're in, as the most valuable thing that we have. And we have to stop with this idea that you just put anything in your body you know, you're gonna put the best, you know, if you bought a brand new anything and they said, don't do this, do this, oh, you, you're gonna follow the rules to the T. Well, guess what, there are rules for our body and we have to follow those rules. And if you don't, then you have health issues that cost money. So where you think you're saving on this end, buying the McDonald's and whatnot, but then when you miss three days of work because the children are sick with the flu or this or that and the other, because their immune systems have been broken down by sugar, you, so it's about retraining their thinking. Um, at the end of the day, all of this is about retraining the mind because you can put a lot of things in place and you'll end up getting the same thing that you always had if there's not a change of the mind. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, um, the day after <coughs> your name came and spoke to the boys at Flannerhouse, House, uh, our oldest, he's 24, and he came in the next normally go to the gas station and get breakfast before they come in and uh, he instead he was bringing in chips and a, a lemonade every day chips and lemonade chips and lemonade 
And the day after she spoke, he brought in a banana and orange juice that he had got from the gas station. Oh. That, like, I had to leave because I was like, that little thing made me tear up because I was like, yeah. they're so using this information that she gave them in order to uh, make choices. And like she said, within those constraints that they have, they do have all these constraints. Their, their only choice is to go to the gas station. However, there there is bananas there, you know, and mm -hmm. that just yeah. kind of touched me. Because that, that just touched me too. That's, that's good to know. Um, um, that's really what it's all about. And, and it's about give, but we have to keep doing it. And then we have to support them in that transition. That's the other thing um, where food demos and things like that come in handy because, okay, if I want to eat healthy, I don't even know where to start, right? I mean, where do I start? And I just had a lady that I really admire um, that we met with yesterday ask me to help her with her diet. She said, this is for me. She says, this is off the subject, but I want you to help me get my diet together. You know, and she was talking about her grandchildren and how they're trying to put them on medication because they're hyper in school. I'm like, well, you feed them a bowl of sugar for morning <laughs> for breakfast. Yeah, and then you ask Johnny to sit down and can't figure out why he can't pay attention to this Mr. Rogers style lecture that you're giving him. <laughs> I mean, come on, we have to rethink that entire, you know, paradigm as well. Um, any more questions? I think I'm out of time. Yes, we're okay. out of yes. time. Um, so, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's all thank Vivian. Oh, thank you. Time.